coming to the back to our program, we could have entitled this program before Jonathan Levin. <laughs> but announcement of Levin's appointment as Stanford's 13th president to take office on August 1st came months after this program was planned. And that title would have obscured the reason we chose the Sterling presidency in the first place. Wallace Sterling's presidency was a transformative one. And much of the way that we and others view Stanford University today comes from changes, policies, and accomplishments during his tenure. Our selection of this program was heavily influenced by Stanford Historical Society's recently published book, this one here, Stanford's Wallace Sterling, Portrait for Presidency, by Roxanne Nyland and Cassius Clerk. This work of serious scholarship grounded in deep archival research took more than a dozen years to research, write, and publish. And this book provided essential information for today's program. I'd like to acknowledge that author Roxanne Nyland and the contributing editor of the book, Karen Bartholomew, are here with us today. Thank you. But today's program does not just focus on Wallace Sterling. It takes a, wi a wider view to look at all Stanford presidents and to offer some perspectives on presidential leadership and on higher education today. Our panel is rich in scholars with deep experience at Stanford and at other universities and on higher education in general. The program will begin with prepared remarks by each of the three panelists. Jane Sheehan is Dickinson Professor of Humanities Emeritus at Stanford. Jim graduated from Stanford with a BA and earned his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. He taught at Northwestern for 15 years. He returned to Stanford to succeed Gordon Craig, Stanford's great scholar of European history. Jim is a highly productive scholar. He's the author of many articles and books and is the recipient of many international honors and awards. His latest book, recently published, is Making of a Modern Political Order, The Problem of the Nation State. And of note for this panel, Jim was once a member of the Stanford Presidential Search Committee. William Chase is Honorary Professor of English Emeritus at Stanford, where he taught for 20 years before becoming President of Wesleyan and thereafter President of Emory University. Bill also received his PhD at Berkeley. He is a captivating teacher and specializes in the work of James Joyce, in addition to W.B. Yeats, T.S. Eliot, and Ezra Pound. And here in Stanford Continuing Studies, he has taught courses on Flannery O'Connor, William Faulkner, and others. As one who has taken his courses, I can attest to his charm and skill. He has always been a popular, sought-after teacher. His experiences as a faculty member and as a university president, give him an important perspective on this panel. Jeffrey Cox, recent past president of the Historical Association, Science Society, is senior associate dean for finance and administration. Jeff earned his PhD in philosophy from the University of Chicago. He served as associate provost and director of financial and budget planning at the University of Chicago. And at Stanford, he was vice provost for institutional planning. He is also knowledgeable about online education and served as president of two online educational universities. His depth of experience makes him a panelist who can address financial issues that are an essential part of Stanford's history. We will now begin with Jim Sheehan, followed by Bill Chase and Jeff Cox. Jim will return for summary comments and then we will move to, I think, a spirited Q&A. Jim? Thank you, Larry. Good to see you all here. Familiar faces and some unfamiliar ones. Um, oh, no, I have to click this. You know, technology, like horses, <laughs> senses fear. So. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, there it is. 
Well, you all know who that is. Um, if there were a history of university presidencies, the chapter on the president would be called the year of the search. Because Stanford, University of California at Berkeley, University of California in Los Angeles, Yale, Harvard, Penn, and I'm sure others, and there may, that list may be uh, extended even as we speak, um, are all, or were all, searching for a president or, in some cases, a chancellor. It's interesting, I think, that as of today, May 1st, only Stanford and Berkeley have announced their choice. It's equally interesting how very similar these two choices are. Both of them, one a current dean of the business school, the other a former dean of the business school, both with PhDs in economics from MIT, and both insiders, both people with deep roots in the institution they have been chosen to lead. It's also worth noting that those other schools on my list have not yet announced a choice. Late in the day, we want when someone is to begin in the fall. Uh, there are two reasons why they, they may not announce a choice. One is the committee may be in some way deadlocked and unable to reach an agreement. The other, and to my mind a more probable reason, is that they may be having trouble finding someone willing to take this job. <laughs> a job that we need not elaborate on the, the reasons, a job that is increasingly difficult to do. A recent survey of a fairly large number of university presidents found that 32% of them would not recommend a talented colleague seek the job they were then holding. And I suspect that number under reports. I'm sure that on some days that would be 100%. But uh, it is nonetheless an incredibly difficult and trying job uh, under the best of circumstances. And I think there's reason to think we are not in the best of circumstances at the moment. Now, what I want to do in the time I've been allotted is to talk uh, briefly about Stanford's presidents mm -hmm. and how the evolution of the presidency and the kind of people who got the job reflect changes in the university. And then uh, I will make a very brief comparison to uh, four peer institutions by looking at their uh, presidents and how they have changed over time. And as you will see, I hope, uh, Wallace Sterling is not only a transformative, as Larry said, a transformative figure for the nature of this university, it's also a transformative figure for the nature of the presidency. The presidents before and after Sterling are significantly different characters with different experiences and uh, personal gifts. Now, Jonathan Levin was selected by a search committee of 20 people, carefully selected to represent the university, uh, trustees, faculty, an undergraduate, a graduate, a postdoc, a member of the staff, uh, which met for a long and difficult period of time at first, uh, opening their proceedings to letters, many of you have probably written, many of you, some of you at least, have written letters that they solicited. And then as the game gets tighter, uh, more confidential considerations. They were assisted, as many of these searches are, by professional search firms. Another sign of the times, I think. Uh, in the Chronicle of Higher Education, there are 76 firms that advertise their services for academic searches. Uh, kind of remarkable if you think about the way, what that tells us about the nature of this, this process. Well, 
David Starr Jordan, Jordan was also the product of a search committee, um, but it was smaller. It, 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 it consisted of two people, you know who they were. Uh, it, and if I tell you they traveled on their search uh, journeys in a private railroad car, it, the guests will uh, no longer be uh, necessary. But anyway, Jane and Leland uh, traveled around the country. They, they decided they were going to start this university in, in memory of their, their dead son. And they sought advice about faculty and especially about leadership. The most consequential <laughs> meeting of this small search committee was with the president of Cornell, Andrew White. And they asked him who he thought might be a good job, good for them. And he recommended a student of his, someone that he had known, uh, who was now, at a, had become for the last five or six years, uh, the president of the University of Indiana, uh, a job he had taken at a very early age. He was a, a scientist, a, a theologist, famously said uh, when he came to Stanford that he tried to meet, he tried to meet students and uh, every time he learned the name of a freshman, he forgot the name of a fish. Um, <laughs> he was, in any case, uh, an eminent figure, uh, a public intellectual in some ways. Uh, now, unfortunately, his career is much shadowed by his unfortunate views on eugenics, something that he shared with a great many of his contemporaries, I have to say. Uh, but a man who uh, accomplishments of establishing this far western provincial place, bringing in a faculty, surviving an earthquake, surviving Jane Stanford. Uh, I, I don't list those in order of difficulty. <laughs> and uh, uh, managing to get it. It is an example, I think, of how the university began with a very personal, um, hands-on uh, efforts by its founders. His successor, uh, John Casper Branner, uh, was another insider in a way. He had been brought by uh, Jordan from Indiana to Stanford among the uh, inaugural faculty. He was a geologist, relatively eminent scientist, um, someone who agreed to take over from Jordan, but, but also said he would only do it uh, for a short period of time, which the trustees agreed with. He was, once again, an example of how personal connections. He was Jordan's protege and uh, got the job because of him. Was not in it for very long. He was, except for Kenneth Pitzer, the shortest serving of our presidents. Um, and he was replaced uh, by Ray Lyman Wilbur. Now, it is very difficult to imagine how someone with Ray Lyman Wilbur's background would be made a university president in 2024. He went to Stanford. That was important. He was an undergraduate here. He went to medical school here. He was a practicing physician, some skill. But most important, and the key to his appointment, he was a friend of Herbert Hoover's. They had met early on uh, in his career, in Wilbur's career. <coughs> And Hoover thought he was a solid, serious, reliable man, so with such confidence that during the time that Hoover was president, uh, he went back to Washington and became his Secretary of the Interior. Once again, can you imagine if a, if a university president going to his trustees and saying, well, you know, I'm going to take the next four years off because I've been offered a cabinet appointment. Uh, and in fact, although there were interim uh, presidents, uh, Wilbur did run the place uh, from a distance without, without great cost. He is then replaced, and this is a figure that uh, I think is an important illustration of the main theme of my remarks. He is replaced by Donald Tresser. Donald Tresser was also a Stanford undergraduate. Having a Stanford degree was at that point very important. He was a graduate of the medical school, although he never practiced medicine, because as soon as he got his MD, he went to work for his wife's company, the Curry Company, which uh, ran the concessions in Yosemite Park. And it was there that he spent his career, always an active Stanford alumnus, a member of the Board of Trustees, 
chairman of the Board of Trustees in 1943 when Wilbur decides that he would leave office. Trezeder recognized, and I think rightly so, uh, that in the middle of the Second World War, that was not the time to look for a university president. Uh, that a lot of the best candidates would be much involved with other things. There were all kinds of logistical problems. So after a rather fitful effort to find a replacement for Wilbur, he took the job himself. Uh, he had no academic experience whatsoever. Uh, but nonetheless, he had good friends on the Board of Trustees, of which he had been its chair, and was a man, I think, of considerable substance and great charm. Uh, alas, he died uh, suddenly on a trip to New York in 1948, uh, making it very difficult, it seems to me, for us to come to terms with what his presidency might have, might have entailed if it had lasted longer. He certainly was successful in leading the university out of the Second World War and the difficulties that arose. He began to realize that fundraising was a central part of what the university had to do, but as I said, he uh, didn't live long enough to really leave much of a work. And that then brings us uh, to Wallace Sterling. Now, in Wallace Sterling, we see for the first time something resembling a modern search. Uh, the decision was largely in the hands of the trustees, uh, but there was a faculty advisory committee. How much advice they actually gave, I'm not sure. And there was an alumni advisory committee. There was a formal process, in other words, uh, as there had not been clearly before. Sterling uh, was not the kind of man who would make a short list today. Uh, he had virtually no scholarly credentials. He'd, he'd been doing other things. Um, he'd spent his academic career at uh, Caltech, where he was a historian. A great university, but a university which by its focus necessarily the humanities were, were peripheral. But he had great presence, he had great skill in human affairs, he had good close ties to, to Stanford where he got his PhD, um, close ties to the trustees, especially the Southern California branch. And he had been made, his first really important administrative position, he had been made head of the Huntington Library, a job he held very briefly because he quickly uh, came to Stanford. So you can see in Sterling still one part of that kind of old style. He had to be approved by Herbert Hoover, by the way, <coughs> who wanted to know his views on the New Deal. Um, <laughs> and, uh, cautious. And, uh, <clears throat> but not positive. And um, he had been, had to be passed by Herbert Hoover, but uh, <clears throat> he was essentially taken because he made a good impression on the men, and they were men, of course, who made the decisions. The next president, Kenneth Pitzer, is a very good example for every search committee. Because on paper, it's hard to think of a candidate more impressive than Kenneth Pitzer. A great scientist, in some ways the most eminent uh, scholar to have this job, a chemist, dean of the College of Chemistry at Berkeley, <clears throat> president of Rice University for six years, where he had been a success, and entered Stanford in its most turbulent, difficult moment. He did not last long, as most of you know. And he was, I think, an example of something that if we read the newspapers, we will immediately recognize. And that is how very difficult it is to come into a new university at a moment of crisis. A time when you don't have a constituency, don't know all of the ins and outs, and where you are forced to make rapid decisions in a playing field that is still largely unfamiliar. Well, Pitzer, as you know, did not last more than two years. He went on to have a great career as a scientist, by the way, so it's not, it's not a tragic story, uh, but an illustrative one. 
He is then replaced by his provost, Richard Lyman, who had actually in many ways been the, the most powerful force in this crisis-filled university, um, and had had that as signs of character and resolution and courage uh, that were essential to make, the, make it possible to weather this very, very stormy sea. Now, in the next, uh, the next presidents, and I won't go into detail on any of them, but the, there's a couple of things to be noted about all of the, the post-Sterling presidents. One is, none of them had a Stanford degree. The insider position, so very important for people like Tresseter, and even important for Sterling, no longer counted. Jonathan, Jonathan Levin, by the way, is the first president since Sterling to have a Stanford degree, an undergraduate degree. Um, the other thing about this group is all of them had been either presidents or provosts, presidents of other universities, provosts mostly at Sanford, although in Gerhard Casper's case at Chicago. So what happens in the post-Sterling years, as you can easily understand, is that the pressure to have someone with serious academic experience becomes an essential element in any successful search. And it's not difficult to understand why. Let me just say a, a couple of words, because I don't, I don't have a lot of time, uh, but let me just say a couple of words about how the Stanford experiences compares to what I've chosen rather arbitrarily as uh, some peer in, uh, institutions. That is Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Chicago. So I looked at the, I did what the ancient historians call a prosopography, a kind of group biography of the 20th century presidents of these institutions, 35 of them. Uh, what do most of them, 31 out of the 35, have in common? Uh, you get one guess, they're men. Um, and uh, the other thing they have in common is that there is the variety of their disciplines. There's a kind of a semi-emphasis on economists and lawyers, but, but there, there, there are no clear disciplinary path. The other thing they have in common is that as we move after, past the sterling years at Stanford into the, into the post-war period, almost all of them have significant academic experience. Almost all of them had been either presidents at other universities, sometimes bigger ones, sometimes smaller ones, uh, or had been provosts or deans. In other words, the premium on hiring someone who knows how these complicated institutions work, or at least one can hope he or she knows, is more and more important. The days of the Donald Cressiders are over. And it's worth noticing that some of the most transformative university presidents, Sterling, Robert Hutchins of Chicago, Robert Goheen of Princeton, all came with so little academic experience, administrative experience that none of them, I think, would, as I said, made a, a short list today. Well, you see, as we look at both the process of the search and the kind of people these searches find, we see reflected here the way in which the university has changed. The character, the complexity, the size, all of those elements that make Stanford what it is. And because I think our minds are less apt to focus on scale, we sometimes miss just how powerful and important these changes of scale were. My two colleagues, will now, I think, help us understand what that meant for Stanford. Um, I'm not going to speak much about myself, but I 
thought I'd share this with you. When I left Stanford after teaching here for 20 years, I went to Western University in Middletown, Connecticut, in a period of extraordinary chaos and difficulty and pain on that campus, and I was most certainly unprepared for the job. And what got me through those six years was a simple fact that would occur about once a week. People would come to me, faculty people, trustees and so forth, and say, you know, that must be a very, very difficult job. My heart goes out to you, it strikes me as so difficult. And then I would summon up this phrase that kept me afloat for six years, this is an easy job. After all, everyone seems to know how to do it. <laughs> and I coasted on that for six years. But what I have to say to you this afternoon is not about me at all. It's, it is about Wally Sterling. Uh, and everything I have to say is distilled from this most remarkable and worthy book. I read it with great care and attention. It is worth a read. Yes, it is heavy. <laughs> but it is worth your time. So let me begin by asking you with me to take a look at the landscape, the geography of elite American higher education when, in the year 1949, Wally Sterling took the job as president. You look at that geography and what do you see? The most prestigious schools are the Ivy League, Harvard, that is, Yale, Princeton, UC Berkeley, University of Chicago, the University of Michigan, Indiana University, Caltech, and MIT. That's the landscape on this continent in 1949. Two decades later, let's look again at the geography. The most prestigious schools are the Ivy League, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, UC Berkeley, the University of Chicago, the University of Michigan, Indiana University, Caltech, MIT, and Stanford. That's the seismic change, which it means that Stanford and Stanford alone, beginning in the post-World War II years, was on its way to shattering the paradigm of educational excellence in this country. Because of the rise of Stanford, that paradigm had to change. Wally Sterling presided over that change. What were the particular freedoms he enjoyed as a new president of this school? He was, as he began, constrained. Well, how was he constrained and what liberties did he have? He was, as he began, constrained by the tradition and the reputation of this institution. What was that reputation? Stanford in 1949 was provincial, suburban, young, lacking in faculty strength, lacking a strong endowment, and weakened by years of deferred maintenance. But he was free because like most other presidents of the time, that time being post-war America, he was by nature magisterial and commanding, and could by his very presence be expected to live and enjoy power for many years. His presidential colleagues of that time were exactly the kind of persons who were expected to preside for many, many years. Kingman Brewster at Yale, 1963 to 1977. Robert F. Goheen at Princeton, 1957-1972. Nathan Pusey at Harvard, 1955-1970. Presidential longevity was a, was a tradition that was begun early in the 20th century and continued, its exemplars being the granddad of them all, Nicholas, Nicholas Murray Butler of Chicago, who was president of that school from 1902 to 1945. I think the current president of Columbia will not last as long. 
Robert Maynard Hutchins in sh Chicago was president from 1929 to 1945. Presidents were meant to be agents of stability, avatars of permanence, barriers against momentary change. Presidents today serve, as you can tell from Jim Sheehan's remark, presidents today survive on average for about six years. Rarely are they seen or survive as agents of stability, barriers against momentary change. As they come, so they go. Sometimes they go very swiftly. And as they, uh, uh, Sterling, Sterling on the other hand, was free and was appointed with a clear understanding that he was to last for decades, and he did. Sterling was free because the state of California in which he found himself was in those post-war years dramatically expanding in population, in manufacture, in entertainment, in business, in tourism, and the development of its natural resources such as oil. The ever-rising tide in the state would, by year by year, pull up all the ships. He was free because he could see, as Governor Pat Brown and Clark Kerr, running the University of California system, at the same time could see. These three gentlemen all saw the same thing. California was ready for a rapid and dramatic expansion of higher education in the state. Brown and Kerr directed their joint attention to public higher education, and out of that focus arose the nine campuses of the University of California. Also soon came the state system of local universities and junior colleges. Sterling was also free because his school faced almost no real competition in private higher education in this state. Only the Claremont campuses in Southern California and those schools remained small as they wanted to be, cloistered and focused almost entirely on undergraduate education. Sterling was free also because alone among university presidents, he commanded the great luxury of the Stanford gift now 50 years old when Sterling began his presidency. The luxury of a huge campus, 8,000 acres, on which he could build classrooms, labs, dorms, and most unusual for any university, housing for the faculty. And with the size of that campus, he could see how right and logical and strategic it would be to move the medical school down from San Francisco in the early 50s to that most, this most spacious campus. To make a move of that kind demanded of him enormous patience and very adroit diplomacy, both of which Sterling commanded. And he was free because the faculty the, that he inherited was docile, <laughs> underpaid, and was only too glad to be led by a president who seemed gifted with a vision for what Stanford and perhaps they themselves could become. And he was free in another way because the Stanford students at the time were almost uniformly, in almost entirely uniform in background, ethnicity, religion, and social and sexual interests. They did not protest they did not demand. They did not think of themselves as customers, <laughs> nor did their proud parents. In their uniform way, they enjoyed over four years this campus and its sports team, its fraternities, its frolics, and its pranks. And now and again, they also benefited from the classes in which they were <laughs> enrolled. In sum, freedom and constraint, Sterling could and did exercise considerable discretionary power, more than any other Stanford president succeeding him would again possess. The trustees at that time trusted, indeed adored Wallace Sterling, and he enjoyed their company, 
He played the piano and he was a marvelous raconteur. He freely appointed a spectrum of university leaders without any searches beneath him, vice presidents, deans, other officers. He knew well both how to exercise power and how to delegate power. In the world beyond the campus, he mixed well with business leaders, profited from his associations with the Bohemian Club in San Francisco, raised financial support from both alumni and non-alumni, and thus, year by year, presided over both growth and stability. About that financial support and how it was deployed, I think you will shortly hear from my colleague, Jeff Cox. And he could and did appoint Frederick Terman as provost an office that hardly existed before Terman took the job. That single appointment resides at the root of Stanford's growth and prowess during Sterling's time. Sterling would be the face of Stanford, the central public figure, the voice of Stanford, the leader on display. Terman would recruit the new faculty, promote faculty who produced the best research results, would weed out those who did not. Stirl Terman was stubborn, determined, undramatic, and relentless, and he ran a faculty meritocracy whose most important meritocratic members helped him to recruit other people just like them. Sturman, Terman's strategy has rightly been called steeples of excellence, and that was combined with post-Sputnik federal funding research, leading scientists, engineers, and even historians and social scientists would be lured to the campus, and they would then bring with them to the campus both federal funds and prestige. And thus the growth of what was once orchards and vegetable gardens into what we know today is Silicon Valley, a global epicenter of innovation, money, and influence. And that, in the briefest sum, is how Stanford was set on the course that would change the geography, the constellation of American higher education. Later presidents, as you have seen, Lyman, Kennedy, and others, sustained and enhanced that growth. But by the end of the 1960s, Sterling's time was over. As an ugly and symbolic sign of the time, his office was incinerated by persons unknown and his most valuable personal possessions lost. The students were no longer uniform and polite. The faculty wanted more power and the faculty took it. Racial strife in American cities, the tragic disaster of Vietnam, illicit drugs, birth control pills, and pulsing music came forward in great power, and they all changed Stanford. But Sterling, constrained as he must have felt when first taking the job in 49, and yet marvelously free over the many years to do as he saw best for Stanford, had made by then an immense difference to this campus. His legacy, legacy is indeed profound. The money he raised, the impressive rise in university endowment he oversaw, the installment of the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center that he and others made possible, the overseas centers, the study of education, and the fusion of research and clinical care at Stanford Medicine are all chapters of the Sterling story. That story is a story that can never be told again. History never really repeats itself. Sterling's story can be told but once. I've given you a version of that story. It helps to flesh out, I think, the larger story, the larger campus of the history that Jim Sheehan just gave you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is indeed an honor to be a member of this panel with such distinguished colleagues as Jim and Bill, and being third in the lineup means that they've said all the important things already. Um, what you're going to hear as I talk is that although we did uh, get together and, 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 and do a little bit of planning for this session, 
uh, we did not work to uh, coordinate our remarks very co closely, and so you're going to hear some overlapping themes, but I think some complementary ones as well as I try to wrap up uh, some remarks. Um, I've spent my own career as a staff member primarily working for a succession of presidents and provosts at some great universities, and I think that has allowed me uh, a kind of bottoms-up perspective as I think about what uh, university presidents mean. I've long been curious about what, make these, what makes these, these extraordinary organizations tick, um, and I've had a, the chance to sort of look at some of the, uh, the plumbing behind them. I guess I'm mixing metaphors, but you get the mechanical uh, notion that I have in mind. Um, and and uh, so that's the lens that I wanted to bring to, to, to this today. One of the jobs of a university president is to assemble a leadership team. We, we give credit to the person at the top, but of course uh, he or she does not do it all themselves. Uh, among his many accomplishments, President Sterling assembled a group of all-stars to help build and transform Stanford into perhaps the most successful university of the post-war era. The Sterling team redefined strategy and management in higher education in ways that continue to influence not just Stanford, but I think every other research university in the country. Um, Bill mentioned Terman, who was obviously a key player in this, but I want to focus for a moment on uh, a third member of, I think, the most powerful trio here, Ken Cuthbertson, who's a name some of you will know. Kenneth Cuthbertson, in our, our uh, book that we're celebrating today, is, is called An Engine of Change. Um, he was a remarkable university citizen. He served as both the head of development chief fundraising officer of Stanford, and its chief financial officer. Uh, this is an unprecedented uh, pair of portfolios to put together. He both raised the money and paid a large role in deciding how to spend it. Um, he introduced important innovations in both of these portfolios. Among other things, he organized, I think, what must be considered the first modern fundraising campaign of any university in the country, raising then unprecedented amounts of money, organizing the alumni, uh, building up the sort of modern notion of a development office. Uh, and he made similar uh, important innovations on the financial management side, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. Doing either of these jobs well would be a challenge for most mortals. Uh, doing both simultaneously is literally unimaginable today. And I think would have been that, except for the remarkable example of Ken Cuthbertson. Uh, you see him here in this other picture with, uh, with President Sterling. Uh, today we would call the third member of that picture uh, photo bombing. Uh, <laughs> seemed to have heard there was a free lunch, so I <laughs> you were hard at work. Um, Universities, like all corporations, issue financial reports, and I've always thought that financial reports are an underappreciated art form. Um, this is one that Ken Cuthbertson wrote um, in 1969, uh, the very end of the Sterling uh, era, it, and included in it a 20-year retrospective of both his time and Wallace Sterling's time at Stanford. Uh, I know that you can't read this. Uh, the title of it is, is indicative of the main message, though. It is called The University and the Federal Government, an Uncertain Alliance. And I want to talk a bit about that. Um, financial reports of organizations of all kinds, including universities, are as much um, formal reports of the accounts of the university as well as marketing documents. Uh, they're often full of boastful claims and confident predictions. In 1969, Cuthbertson used the occasion of this report to, as I said, write a 20-year retrospective, essentially a summary of the Sterling years, uh, through a financial lens. It's not a very upbeat document, quite frankly. In fact, it is a remarkably candid assessment of the university's situation coming after two decades of extraordinary growth. Now, to be sure, the report celebrates Stanford's unprecedented ascent into the elite ranks of higher education during this period, but it also warns that the financial underpinnings of this achievement may not be sustainable. 
Cuthbertson says that Stanford and higher education in general may have become too dependent on an unreliable partner, as you see from the title, namely the federal government. The 20-year period that Cuthbertson recounts was transformative not only for Stanford but for American higher education in general. The GI Bill at the end of World War II had swelled student populations across the country and had begun to make college an experience, an expectation of the middle class, not just uh, a, a privilege reserved for the wealthy. In short order, federally guaranteed student loan programs became a foundational part of university finances. Stanford's undergraduate population grew about 17% during this period. That was modest growth compared to the great public universities, which doubled and tripled during this period. But the percentage of tuition at Stanford supported by student loans doubled from around 5% to more than 10%. A more dramatic impact on Stanford is attributable to the U.S. government's decision after World War II to make permanent the federally funded research network that had arisen during the war and arguably had won the war for uh, the Allies. Sterling, Provost Terman, and Cuthbertson seized the opportunity to remake Stanford as a research powerhouse. Sponsored research at Stanford grew more than tenfold between 1952 and 1969, and that doesn't count the funds going to SLAC, which also began during this period. With this growth in research, faculty numbers tripled, graduate enrollments grew by 80%. Looking back over this period, Cuthbertson writes, quote, during these years, Stanford has consciously and deliberately tried to match the government's interest in research with its own interest in strengthening the overall educational operation. Indeed, using government support to advance its educational programs, Stanford appears to have been more successful than most institutions. Stanford's emergence in the last 20 years as one of the outstanding universities in the nation in part reflects how Stanford conceptualized the use of federal funds." End of quote. By 1969, however, Cuthbertson had become concerned that the government's enthusiasm for higher education was waning. Uh, he goes on to write, unfortunately, while the government may consider higher education a necessity in the last two years, that would have been in the late 60s, it has been equivocal in its support of that necessity. The days of rapidly expanding federal support appeared to be coming to an end, and as a result, Stanford was preparing for a period of belt tightening. Now, from our vantage point, 50 years after Cuthbertson, Cuthbertson's report, we can see that the federal government remains a bedrock of Stanford's economy. But the threat of retrenchment is always present. By entering into this, quote, uncertain alliance, as Cuthbertson called the government partnership, Stanford took on the ongoing challenge of remaining nimble and flexible as the political and economic winds changed in Washington. The theme of our panel today is university presidents before and after Sterling. And in this vein, I want to propose a hypothesis that I won't have time to fully defend but I think I can make the case for it briefly. Stanford was one of a group of universities founded in the late 19th century, each of which was led by a visionary founding president. As Jim mentioned, we had David Starr Jordan here at Stanford, William Rainey Harper at Chicago, Andrew White at Cornell, Daniel Coit Gilman at Johns Hopkins. This generation of presidents who exercised their talents in the late uh, in the 1890s primarily, uh, were each driven by a vision of what the modern research university should be. And despite long odds against them, each of them succeeded in building an incredible institution, mostly from scratch. Like the leaders of startups everywhere, they were driven by passion and by an unwavering belief that the future needed what they were building. Nearly 60 years later, after the founding period, Sterling led to what amounted to a second founding of Stanford. But I would argue that his superpower was not vision, but strategy. 
The art of strategic leadership is to align an organization to thrive in its environment, to optimize the internal structures of the organization in order to maximize external opportunities. Sterling and his leadership team at Stanford did this better than anyone and thereby propelled Stanford to unparalleled success in the post-war period. I think they also forever changed what it means to lead a university. Vision and academic convictions are still necessary, but not sufficient. It also requires vigilance in reading the environment and responding strategically. After Sterling, university presidents could no longer be just first among equals within the faculty. They became CEOs of major enterprises with complex relationships with multiple constituencies. Their success as presidents depended critically on their ability to read the environment and to align the internal culture of the university with the external forces bearing on it. One story recounted in the Sterling book illustrates Stanford's innovative leadership during this era. In 1960, representatives of the Ford Foundation paid a visit to Stanford. They were wondering if any American university had given any thought to, quote, where it might be in 10 years. Stanford had, in fact, developed a comprehensive strategic plan. In fact, Mr. Cuthbertson did that, that encompassed academics, facilities, fundraising, and a comprehensive financial plan. Uh, the Ford Foundation found no such sophisticated planning at any other institution it visited, and so it rewarded Stanford with an unprecedented $25 million grant that's more than a quarter billion in today's dollars. No other institution in the country got more than six million. President Sterling and his team invented the modern research university and its administrative structures. And in so doing, they invented a management ethos that I think continues to be necessary to run places of this complexity. We continue to benefit from these innovations. Thank you. Now, don't worry, I'm not keeping you from the questions, let alone the refreshments, but I did want to try to give you a couple of images that I hope will give us, give a kind of concrete expression to what I think are the themes of today's remarks. Buildings, just four. Buildings are the kind of stage on which the drama of institutional life is acted. And if you think about the changes in these buildings, you think about how much change is incorporated in them. Over here, the firehouse, when I was an undergraduate, still run by amateur firemen. There were a couple of professionals there, I think, to try to keep them going. Um, the firehouse as it exists now, and the difference between those two is I think a difference between a university that is still small, provincial, casual, amateur, and one that is not. An even more dramatic difference is the difference between the Bowman Alumni House, a really fine building, and although it's been much changed over the years, it's now the Sanford Humanities Center, it's still a fine building. Um, uh, but as you can see, a modest one. And here, of course, the Ariaga uh, Alumni Center uh, that is anything but uh, modest in, in size and character. I shall refrain. <coughs> uh, discretion prevents me from making aesthetic comments about this. Uh, but the difference in scale between these two buildings and the kind of institutional life that was carried on mm -hmm. within them is, it seems to me, a very good concrete example uh, of the changes we talked about today. Now it's time to hear to them. And Don Kennedy and Talby and I got in a car and drove to Sacramento for the event. Uh, and on the way back, I happened to mention Pitzer. And Talby said, well, you know, Ken was, uh, a, a, when he was first appointed as assistant professor, I was appointed as assistant professor at Cal. 
In fact, he said there were four assistant professors hired that year. Of those four professors, three went on to win the Nobel Prize, and one went on to be president of Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> but he also said, he said, I think if Ken had not gone into university administration, he too would have won the Nobel Prize. So, now, we're ready for your questions. Uh, Jeff. I'd like to pick up on your point that the book on Sterling is fantastic. I am about halfway through it. I would be eager to learn more about Kenneth Pitzer's administration and the difficulties he faced here. Is there any comparable work, or if not a book-length work, uh, maybe some pointers on where to begin researching that topic? Uh, no. Uh, uh, let me just ask our panel so to talk a little bit about the Sterling book. But I'm not aware of anything that, of any Stanford president. Nothing. Nothing. Uh, uh, is comparable to the Sterling book. It should be easy to cover. It lasted 19 months. <laughs> I would guess the place to look would be histories of the, the, the time itself, right? The, um, the memoirs of, of student activists. Uh, I don't know anything about Pitzer himself or at his time at Stanford. He was, a, as, as Larry said, he was a very eminent uh, uh, scientist, and he came from a famous academic family, Pitzer College, which is one of the Claremont colleges, was named after his father. So uh, I suspect there, you have to do what all serious scholars do, Google him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was there at the time when he left Rice, and we heaved a sigh of relief when he left because everybody liked him personally. He was a very nice guy, but he was really ineffectual. He found it difficult to the point of impossibility to make decisions and make them stick. And when he left Rice, we waved goodbye and wished him well and told him he probably should find something else to do. And he really would have been a much better uh, chemist uh, than he was president. Thank you. Uh, is there a question? No. Well, that's, that's, that's very interesting to know. Because the search committee should have known that. Uh, Rich. I have a, a quick comment um, on the last um, point, which was um, uh, before he passed, I did a long interview with Dick Lyman, which ran in the magazine after he passed. Mm -hmm. um, and Dick talked quite a bit about Ken Pitzer. And uh, the line I remember well from that uh, piece was, um, you know, he didn't have a confrontational bone in his body at a time when you needed to be a little confrontational to survive. Um, but that isn't actually my question. My question goes to um, what Jeff was talking about in terms of the relationship with the federal government. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the situation with the indirect cost controversy in the 90s that ended up uh, costing Don Kennedy his job. Yeah. Well, that's actually, I came to Stanford uh, in the wake of that because I came with Gerard Casper uh, uh, from Chicago. Uh, of course, he was selected to succeed Don. Uh, I think, you know, I guess I'd go back to Cuthbertson's uh, observation that, you know, when you are so dependent on this major source of funding, it makes you uh, very vulnerable to uh, having it upset. And I think that was an occasion where, as we all know, at the end of the day, it proved to be a non-event. There was no malfeasance. There was nothing uh, seriously wrong that Stanford had done, and yet the disruption was just extraordinary uh, and, and costly in countless ways, both financial and otherwise. Um, I remember Don's appearance at uh, Congress and his own commentaries after it. He, I think I can quote him accurately by saying he, he failed to look around the corner. He didn't see this threat coming of a challenge, and I think he uh, took personal responsibility for that. 
Uh, and uh, I think it, it, it goes to this point I was trying to make, that I think that the job of the president is always to be looking out ahead and trying to see what's coming, and not everybody can do that perfectly. There were two people who were seen as eminently ready and talented to become the presidency. That was Dick Lyman and, the, and Herbert Packer. They, had, they were battle-scarred. They'd been through some of the most difficult periods in Stanford's history. They were very much liked by many constituencies on the campus. And for reasons known only to themselves, the trustees decided they would pass by Dick Lyman as president, would not see him, and then had to suffer the ignominy and embarrassment of seeing Pitcher go in 19 months, and then Lyman instantly became president. Her Packer worked with him until his uh, stroke, and Lyman went on, as we know, to be successful in a very difficult, brutal atmosphere on campus for 10 years. You, we've seen from your remarks that the process for choosing a president has changed considerably and by and large for the better, but it seems clear too that search committees still make big mistakes. We've seen some recent <laughs> examples of that. Are there things we should have learned by this time that should be happening in presidential search committees? that for some reason still don't happen? Or is it just the human dilemma that you can never completely understand another human being or predict how that human being will react to difficult circumstances? Well, that's a great question, Michelle. And, and it, it's a question that really gets at the heart of what historians worry about all the time, which is how individuals fit into the historical context in which they find themselves. And of course, you can't predict the, the context. You can't predict the kinds of problems that, that you're going to face. Um, I think you can be very careful. And I, I thought your comments about Pitzer and Rice were very interesting because you have to be very, any search committee has to be very careful that they're not getting positive reports about someone that the institution would like to see leave. Right? <laughs> um, so uh, a certain degree of skepticism is required. But you, you would have a much better chance of not making a mistake <coughs> if you go inside. Those people are known for good or for ill, and nobody comes into any of these jobs being perfect. On paper, some people can look perfect, but knowing a person, seeing that person tested, is, I think, a great gift to any search committee. Well, I already had my hand up. I have a, I have a comment and a, and a similar question to Michelle. So, uh, a prominent Stanford historian once told me that uh, that historians prefer the. Uh, the luxury of 30 years of hindsight before they make any uh, judgments. Uh, uh, during the current times, which are you know uh, somewhat reminiscent of things that happened in, uh, in the Vietnam era and then again in the apartheid era, um, that we see some similarities. But obviously, so there's some major differences now. So, uh, so I guess for the non-historian, it would be interesting to know uh, what lessons we've learned in light of what those differences are. And to give a separate nuance to that, uh, we're looking for a president who's going to run the the university that Stanford has become, but is anybody questioning the university that Stanford has become? Especially those of us who've been here for a long time and seen the change. Well, I, th I think your last comment is one that we all ought to take home and think very, very hard about. Because I think one of the, the difficulties this is not exactly answering your question, but I think it does pick up on your last remark. These institutions have become so complicated that just mastering them at the basic level is a full-time job. In addition to that, of course, a president must articulate the reason why we're here in the first place. And that, I think, is one of the great failures of academic leadership in general. It's growing difficulty in articulating 
what makes universities what they are and makes them different from everything else. And that opens up a vacuum into which all kinds of unwholesome things can rush. Well, I, I would just add, I think there yes. certainly is a sense that we have lost the, you know, the presumption of trust among the public, right? And I think once that goes, it's very, very hard to reclaim. So I think when you said at your remarks, Jim, that many presidents wouldn't advise their colleagues to take the job, I think that's got to be part of the reason why, because you don't come into a room with the assumption that you're representing a, uh, uh, a respected institution. A question in the back. So I hear that uh, David Starr Jordan was actually the Stanford's second choice. The first choice was Francis Walker. And if he was, Francis Walker was MIT's president, um, do you think Stanford would have been a different institution? That's mine. <laughs> so look, that's, I, I, I can't tell you that. I really don't know. Important thing for every historian to say, but not all the time. But in this time, I can say it. I really don't know. I won't answer the question either, but I go back to this question uh, about what Stanford has become and where it's going. And I'll just take one word from Jeff Cox's remarks. He referred to the president as a CEO. These are large corporate entities. They have huge budgets. Between 75 and 80 percent of the operating budget of Stanford University is in medical care, in hospitals, in clinical care. That's an enormous power on this campus. This is not a college. This is a huge research university that brings in millions of dollars, produces great results, and also happens to teach. So how, how does that uh, suggest the role of the provost may evolve? Well, Stanford has a fairly unusual provostship uh, compared to at least some other institutions in that the provost is very much the inside sort of chief operating officer, and that puts her uh, very much in uh, this same line of administrative responsibility. She's managing, uh, you know, what, an eight, nine billion dollar budget, uh, you know, all of the facilities that Jim just ended the talk with, and all of these things land on the provost's desk. So it, uh, although I think it's in, Stanford does that because it means that the chief academic officer still has uh, that perspective in making decisions, administrative decisions. Uh, I think if you ask any of the recent provosts of Stanford, you know, their day-to-day -day lives are taken up with, with budgets and money and, and buildings and, and all kinds of non-academic sort of things that, that are just necessary. Margo. Uh, okay. Sorry, one behind you, then we'll go to Margo. There's someone. Okay. Um, you, on your remark that you just said that uh, the president of a uh, higher education institution is like akin to a CEO, um, how, is, how do you view the leadership qualities that are different between a, a, you know, a for-profit for institution where CEOs preside versus educational institutions and um, in the likes of that how are they responsible to their stakeholders I'd answer the, the question I'm reminded of what George Schultz once said he had left private industry and and had come into academia he was powerful as a in private industry and he said, when I gave an order in my company, I had every reasonable expectation that it would be followed. <laughs> That's not what he found in academic life. <laughs> the chief force in any academic institution is, of course, the faculty. And the faculty are a 
not a random, but a very mixed collection of intellectual and research entrepreneurs, the bulk of whom enjoy tenure and therefore the freedom to do as they want to do. They are not led by anyone. They are led by the respective disciplines which they follow. So a chemist wants to be a better chemist and an English professor wants to be a better English professor. So it's not just herding cats. It is respecting the power of the intellect that is in that faculty because that's what you have. What is your faculty? Your faculty is your strength. They must be respected, but they're not going to do as ordered, nor would they even expect to get an order. What orders them perfectly is the discipline they're in. Jim is a historian. He follows the dictates, the rules, the governing principles, the hallowed ideas of being a historian. So that's, that's the difference. And that's why faculty don't customarily like to be called employees. Margot. So thank you, each of you, for your wonderful presentations. My question is to return to the Sterling book. And I don't know how much you've spoken to each other in terms of uh, preparation, but I'm wondering how you differ on the, your assessment of the impact of Wallace Sterling's presidency, um, or agree, if you could do that, please. I'm not sure we differ. I, I mean, I, I don't sense any sharp differences. I think I personally esteem him as an extraordinary leader in a time now past. He, and he, he moved this institution, as I said. He changed the geography of higher education because he brought this institution into the forefront. Hats off to him. And, but I think what Bill said about faculty is really the the key here. I mean, what Sterling did, of course he moved the medical school and he built, uh, you know, did all of this. That's, that's all important and all fine. What he really did was bring lots and lots of very smart, talented people here. Many more than had been here before. And as what happens when you bring talented people, they want to hire other talented people. And that is his great achievement, right? And, uh, and, and I think his most lasting monument. Let me just add a word that um, about the Sterling book, and I really encourage you to read it because it's a lot of a lot of detail, and you understand the period better. And there's a chapter there about what happened in the Pacific Coast Athletic Conference when USC and UCLA pulled out, and it was a huge matter. And the way Wallace Sterling handled that is dramatically different of what was recently seen. I encourage you all to read the book. <laughs> and now, uh, Stephen, do you have a question? Yes. Um, Fred Terman's name came up. And then Jeff just talked about the unique nature of the Stanford Provost. Not totally unique, but different. How important to these presidents was having their provosts? How important it was. When they work well, they're wonderful. I happen to have the good fortune to work in the provost office under Jim Ross, the provost, who was in some sense term in life. He was non-charismatic. He was a large man who wore both uh, suspenders and a belt. <laughs> he was from Nebraska, and his job, as he saw it, was to solve problems. And they would come to him every day, almost an assembly line, and I would see him work, he'd pick up the problem, and then he would solve it, and they would move along, and, and I marveled at this. I had never seen a person work that way. Matter of fact, these problems can be solved. Let's open the package up. What are the constituents of the problem? So this is, and I once said to him, in a kind of awe, I said, Jim, I just think what you do, I mean, it's such a silly thing, and now I have 
I marvel at what you do. You're wonderful. And he said, well, if I get it right 66% of the time, I'll feel pretty good. <laughs> the modesty, the problem solving, the low level, and he was working with a very charismatic president in Don Kennedy, who was like Sterling, outside, uh, hugely ambitious for the institution, knew the students, liked all the athletic teams, liked everything that Stanford did. Meanwhile, back in his office, Jim Ross was working away. <laughs> well, if there are no further questions, I want to thank and thank our speakers today. Thank you.